This is the News 10 ABC Winter Weather Guide. Hi everyone, uh, Steve Caparizzo here. We got the whole weather team. Uh, tonight is our chance to talk to you about our Winter Weather Guide to get you guys prepared of what we know is coming, right? That's right. I'm meteorologist Jill Swed. Matt Mackey here. And I'm Rob Lindenmuth. You know, with the winter season here, getting our first taste of winter, we've already had that. Tonight we've even assembled the entire team. It's great to have us all together to get you prepared. And we're going to share with you some safety, which is important. And we're also going to take a deep dive into some of the scientific processes that we use to focus our forecast and assess what Mother Nature has in store for us this season. Yeah. We're also going to talk about the threats different types of storms can bring, what you can do to get ready, and of course, what happens after a storm hits. Mm -hmm. And of course, we look at a lot when we're trying to forecast a storm that's going to be coming down the line. And when the, all the ingredients come together, sometimes we can get big ones. You know, I've been doing this for many years, and I've always said forecasting is like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. There's certain pieces that you see, and as a meteorologist, you get excited about the potential of something big happening, but the pieces have to fit together. I'm going to show you the ingredients for the two biggest storms. We call these the golfers. You may remember the blizzard of 93 is probably the most perfect example. We have a subtropical jet stream, moisture from the Pacific Ocean, moving into the Gulf. Now there is a storm in the Gulf of Mexico, so that moisture is already feeding into it. And we have a big dip with the Arctic jet stream down close to the Gulf of Mexico with tremendous energy. So when this hits the warm waters of the Gulf, that storm rapidly intensifies. There's a big temperature contrast. So we have Pacific moisture, Gulf of Mexico moisture, and eventually we have moisture that will be picked up off the Atlantic Ocean. And when they all come together with this Arctic high to the north and a blocking high out over the ocean, watch out as that storm is going to be big in size in a very strong storm. Now as it tracks northeastward, that heavy rain changes to snow on the northern fringe. Typically there's severe thunderstorms along that cold front and moving through Florida. And with that tremendous moisture and energy, a band of heavy snow sets up. And that band actually expands. And that's where we get hit really, really hard. You may have uh, three, four, five inches of snow per hour, maybe even some thunder snow. Now the second scenario, I call this the rapid redevelopment. Arctic polar jet dips down into the Midwest. Again, a tremendous amount of energy or spin. This is what we call a clipper low. When these clipper lows start moving southeast, it hasn't interacted with all that moisture off the East Coast. Again, Arctic high pressure to the north, that's key. Now that storm dives southeastward, and as it does so, it starts to expand. And when it gets to the coast, it picks up all that moisture. This storm rapidly develops, again, the Arctic air moving in, and a band of very heavy snow sets up over us. So they're two distinctly different storms. But when you see the pieces of the puzzle for the golfers in the rapid redevelopment, these typically are some of the biggest snowstorms in the Northeast. In the wintertime, we can get a wide array of precipitation types, sometimes even all in one storm, like the event we had last week to kick off the winter season. We'll break down the four wintry precipitation types, starting with rain. Whether it's summer or winter, the temperature up in the clouds is a given. It's going to be down below freezing, but as the clouds let loose those ice crystals, it's going to interact with air that is above freezing. So melting happens, taking those ice crystals to the liquid form, boom, you get rain, and that will continue to fall in the liquid form all the way down to the ground. But if the ground temperature is just below freezing, maybe there's a shallow layer of sub-freezing air, that's when things start to get interesting. We can get freezing rain. So just like the liquid form, those ice crystals will melt in a deep layer of above-freezing air, staying in the liquid form until it gets hit 
by that sub-freezing air. Again, whether that's a shallow layer or it comes in contact with a cold surface, whether it be a railing, maybe a pavement, your driveway, and it creates that glaze of ice, possibly even some light accumulations, making everything super slippery. We can also get black ice this way. If we shorten up the time that those ice crystals have to melt, so it's a sh more shallow, warming layer, we can get sleet, that pinging on the window that you may hear. So ice crystals go from the process of being frozen to liquid, but then freeze again with a deeper layer of sub-freezing air closer to the surface. We get those ice pellets or otherwise known as sleet. For snow, the entire column of air from top to bottom is below freezing. We just hope with events and setups like this that the ground is cold enough for that snow to start to stick and accumulate. Lake effect snow is very common across the Northeast and in the Great Lakes region, especially early on in the season. Think September, October, November, when the lake water temperature is very warm when you compare it to the air temperature. Lake effect snow typically develops when the surrounding land areas are much cooler than the lake itself. Wind flow pushes the cold air mass over the lake. This colder air will then warm, and as this happens, warmer air will actually rise. This will not only pull up moisture, but it also pulls up the milder air higher into the clouds from the lake and then clouds will develop. The clouds and the moisture are then pushed over colder air on the land and this is when you get the bands of lake snow developing. Usually downwind of the Great Lakes. It is all dependent though on wind direction. The typical areas of lake effect snow are on the south and east sides of the Great Lakes. Again this is when the prevailing winds are from the west or northwest. So why does it matter for us here? The closest Great Lake is nearly 170 miles away from Albany. However, if the conditions are just right and the winds are more out of the west, that lake effect snow can make it just down the Mohawk Valley, and that's when we can get some lake effect snow right here in the capital region. In fact, in some instances, I have seen these lake snow bands extend all the way to Boston. While Lake Ontario is the main culprit for lake effect snow here in the capital region, sometimes a band of snow can extend from Lake Erie and make it all the way to the Berkshires. Again, these are usually extreme cases. Growing up in the Rochester, New York area, I am very accustomed to lake effect snow living close to both Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. But what you may not know, the difference between lake effect snow and a bigger snowstorm on the East Coast is that lake effect snow can pile up a lot quicker. The reason for that is snow ratio. But what is that? Here in the capital region, our average snow to liquid ratio is about 10 to 1, meaning every 10 inches of snow is equivalent to 1 inch of liquid. However, in bands of lake effect, it could be much higher snow to liquid ratios thanks to the very cold Arctic air moving over the lakes. This helps to add to the fluff factor. It is not uncommon to see snow to liquid ratios in lake effect snow, especially near the lakes, up to 20 to 1 or even 30 to 1. Very airy and very fluffy snow, meaning that in certain situations, 30 inches of snow would equal one inch of liquid. So why do we have lower snow to liquid ratios here in the capital region? In determining the ratio, it all comes down to temperature, the depth of the warm layer from the ground to the clouds producing the snow. The warmer it is, or closer to freezing it is, the lower the ratio will be. Deeper cold layers typically yield higher snow to liquid ratios. Another factor in snow accumulation is wind. If it is very windy, this could fracture the snowflake structure and actually lead to lower accumulations. Yeah, when it comes to forecasting in our area, so much of what we see comes down to elevation. The hills, the mountains, the valleys, the terrain in our part of the country, especially when you get a system coming through that's right on the line in terms of temperature. Is it cold enough to snow or is it going to be warm? Is it going to be rain? I want to delve into the factors that affect that and why you'll typically get a bigger snowfall higher up in the mountains. As a rule of thumb, the temperature drops about three and a half degrees every thousand feet you go up in elevation. So I've picked a couple locations. I've listed their elevations. We're going to do some rough math to figure out in a hypothetical scenario where Albany's 37 degrees, where Albany's just getting plain old rain. What do you see at these various heights? Pittsfield's at about a thousand feet. So based on our rule of thumb, three and a half degrees dropping, you'd be around 34 degrees. Lake Placid is at a 1800 feet elevation, they'd be around 30. So a little bit below freezing. Probably a rain snow line is somewhere between these locations. If you keep going up higher and higher, Windham Mountain, the ski slopes that is down in the Catskills, 3000 feet, they'd be at 26. And all other things equal, 
Cascade Mountain, which is a very popular hike up in the Adirondacks at an elevation of 4,000 feet. You'd be down to 23 degrees. That just goes to show, too, if you're trying to get up a mountain in the winter, you need to account for this massive difference. Also, going to be a little windier up top. And of course, you could leave town in Albany, Schenectady, or Troy, down below 1,000 feet. It's in the mid 30s, it's rainy. You get up past Lake Placid, you're kind of in this zone, the wintry mix zone, where you see a little bit of rain, you see a little bit of snow. And then you get up in the higher terrain, below 32 degrees, it is all in the snow. So again, very important to know your elevation, because a lot of times that's make or break when we're putting our forecast out there. Another big factor caused by the hills and the mountains and the valleys when we're trying to forecast snow is something that we call upsloping versus downsloping. Say you've got the winds coming from a certain direction. They go up the mountain range. They get forced uphill, up the slopes of the hills, up the higher terrain. That upward motion, of course, is going to cool the air a little bit. It's going to cause the water in that air to condense. So the windward side of the mountain is going to get more clouds. It's going to get more precipitation. And of course, if it's cold enough, it's going to get some more snow. Meanwhile, on the other side, the air begins to go back downhill. Of course, it's encountering warmer air, but just the very process of it coming down tends to warm it up, dry it out a little bit. And between that and the fact that you robbed a lot of the moisture back over here, you're drier. You get lower snowfall totals behind a mountain range. We call that shadowing. Here's an example of what a typical elevation storm might look like. Of course, you're going to get your highest totals where it's colder, where it's going to be snow from start to finish. So the Greens, the Berkshires, the Taconics, the Adirondacks, the Catskills. You're going to get your lowest totals where it's running warmer. So remember in our scenario, Albany at 37, you're probably not going to get snow at all in a setup like that. Let's rope in the upslope, downslope, the shadowing effect. Hypothetically, we'll say our winds coming out of the south, going into the Catskills, they're going uphill, up the slopes of the mountains, so that's going to enhance the snowfall, enhance the precipitation. Coming downhill into places like Schoharie County or even up into the Mohawk Valley, that's going to rob you of snowfall. A little bit warmer, a little bit less moisture in the air to work with. So again, I'm sure you all can attest to this. Forecasting in these parts, it's tough. I think it's fun, but it's also very tough because of all of these factors, the hills, the mountains, the valleys. It's a ton to keep track of as we go into the winter season. Matt, great job. And you know, we've all been in that situation. Mm -hmm. Where's that rain <laughs> snow <laughs> line going to be, right? Mm -hmm. Or if there's going to be a shadow developing. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Elevation is always coming into play. I've always said this. Out in the Midwest, mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't have to worry. It's flat. It's flat. Oh, yeah. It's easy. So it's easy to do rain snow lines. Uh, around here, there's so much more involved because sea level to oh, four yeah. or 5,000 feet. I, I mean, the Adirondacks, Mount Marcy is like 5,300 feet. So there's a huge spread in that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely crazy. So th the science involved for mm -hmm. us is uh, pretty complicated, mm -hmm. no doubt about that. Absolutely. And now oftentimes people focus on more of the amounts of snow, sleet, and freezing rain, but there are also some big components that come into the season that could be even more detrimental. Oh, exactly right. Jill's talking about those freezing temps and how they can be, be uh, made even harsher by whipping winds. Coming up on your winter weather guide, we break down wind chill, what it is, and how it can make for a very long and difficult winter. You're watching the News 10 ABC Winter Weather Guide. Here we are at beautiful Thatcher Park, high up in the Heldebergs. We all know this is a beautiful vantage point, and it's very windy. Today we're going to talk about wind chill. Now, wind chill, as we all know, is the cooling effect of the wind on your skin. It makes you feel colder. Now, it's not all that bad. Now, think about this. Wind chill in the summer is good. In the winter, it's bad. In the summer, you work outside, you're sweating, the breeze hits you, you cool off. You jump in the swimming pool, you get out, the breeze hits you, you cool off. That's what we call good wind chill. But it's a wind chill in the winter that can be fairly dangerous. Here's an easy way for you to actually create your own wind chill. Take a small cup of water, 
pour it on the back of your hand. And what I want you to do is blow across it. You will actually feel the cooling effect as water's evaporated off, taking energy or heat away from your skin. So that is wind chill. Now, when we look at it, the colder the temperature, the windier the weather, the more the effects wind chill will have on your body. Over the years, there was a lot of research, and the National Weather Service made the chart a little bit more accurate and useful. And they started using it in their daily forecasts in the 1970s. Before we go on, take a look at the wind chill equation. Pretty complicated, right? I'm not going to go into it because it will make my head spin and yours as well. Just know that it works. Now many of us older folks remember the old wind chill charts of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. They were much colder. In fact, in the equation, they used a height of 33 feet for the wind, which obviously is a lot windier. Now there was more research and refinements done, and the brand new wind chill chart, the ones that we use on a daily basis, uh, came out in 2001. I want to show you a comparison as to how different these two charts are. In the new chart with a temperature of zero and a wind speed of 20 miles per hour, it would make it feel like 22 below on exposed flesh. Now, for the same temperature and wind on the older charts, it would feel 39 below. Here's a comparison of the two charts so you can see the differences between the two. Very significant. The old chart is so much colder. I remember forecasting days with the old wind chill chart. I'd be saying wind chills tonight 70 degrees below zero. That won't happen since 2001. You still get 40 to 50 below zero, and that's bad enough. Remember, wind chill temperatures only affect things that are warm blooded. That's us and our pets that it's dangerous for. Now a good rule of thumb, at 18 below, frostbite can occur in 30 minutes. At 35 below, 10 minutes. And at 50 below, frostbite can happen as quickly as five minutes. A good hat to cover your ears will help prevent wind chill. Of course, a good scarf to wrap around your neck and your face to protect you. And of course, some warm gloves will help prevent wind chill. Now, you're still going to be really cold, but the chances of wind chill are greatly reduced. Funny story, guys. Okay. <laughs> You know, you're doing that story and you want it to be windy. Mm -hmm. You figure Thatcher Park, it's got to be windy, right? Sure. It wasn't a, was it a calm day? It was like a calm day. I was, I was actually pretty warm. I'm sure there'll be plenty. No, you're not morning. kidding. Yeah. This is only the beginning. Uh, yes. You know, wind chill is one of those things we all have to be prepared, mm -hmm. it, you know, and again, as we always talk about, just cover your skin. And it's sometimes easy to overlook because we mm -hmm. think, oh, we're inside. We're not, that's not going to be a problem. But mm -hmm. we have to remember also the folks that maybe can't come indoors, the no. homeless, and that's something obviously that they deal with a lot more during you're the wintertime. Absolutely time. right. Still ahead, we're digging into the archives of the early 90s and a storm that many remember like yesterday, you guys include. I'm the old man. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a look back through the blizzard of 1993. I was just a young pup back then and why it lives still on as the storm of the century. You're watching the News 10 ABC Winter Weather Guide. It was an unusually cold but very quiet Friday, March 12th, 1993 across the capital region. The high that day only 26 degrees, nearly 20 degrees cooler than normal for the middle of March. The stage was set for a big northeast snowstorm. Every day had a major snowstorm for the northeast. As we got closer, it looked bigger and bigger. This storm had everything. Blinding snow, thunder snow, blowing and drifting. 
the intensity was four or five inches per hour. It began snowing in the capital region in the afternoon of the 13th and it snowed hard. Most of the snow that fell in Albany all fell in an 18 hour time period. The storm developed in the Gulf of Mexico on March 12, 1993. It quickly moved through the Gulf of Mexico and through the east coast of the United States and into Canada. As it traveled up the coast, it had a tremendous moisture source from the Atlantic Ocean and a lot of cold air was in place over the northeast, which it tapped into to produce one of the biggest snowstorms storms Albany has ever seen. The storm finally dissipated on March 15th, but that was after leaving a path of destruction from Cuba all the way to Maine. A large swath of snow fell in every state across the East Coast from Mississippi, Alabama, and even the Florida Panhandle, where up to four inches of snow fell. Snow was most intense in the Appalachian Mountains, where some in Tennessee and North Carolina received over 50 inches of snow. It was a raging blizzard on a Saturday afternoon, Saturday night. Here in the Northeast, massive amounts of snow were recorded with over 40 inches reported in Syracuse with 26 and a half inches in Albany, one of the largest snowstorms ever for Albany. It wasn't just the snow that many through the capital region were dealing with. The winds also became an issue, reaching blizzard strength for many. Winds gusted up to 144 miles per hour at Mount Washington, while here in the capital region, gusts were reported as high as 53 miles per hour at the Albany International Airport. By Sunday morning, the sun was poking out. Uh, you had two to three feet of snow on the ground. But the big thing was, was the snow drifts. The winds were 30 to 50 miles per hour. And as soon as you cleared a main road, it filled right back in again. At the height of the storm, every major airport along the East Coast, along with nearly all major state highways from Atlanta northeastward, were closed down at one time or another. During the storm, over 10 million people were without power along the East Coast and the Gulf Coast, and unfortunately, 270 people were killed. Behind the storm, record cold air set into much of the eastern half of the country, with high temperatures in the northeast not making it much past 20 degrees, with overnight lows in the single digits both above and below zero. You know, it's amazing to see that video again. Brings back memories when I was a lot younger, number one. Number two, there have only been two times when literally I've been snowed in here. And that was the first time, the blizzard of uh, 93. I lived out in a farm back then. I had six to 10 foot snow drifts the day after the storm ended. You know, sometimes it's a little bit frustrating with, with all the different advisories and warnings, and they can be confusing when you watch the weather. Jill's going to explain the new criteria. I think it makes it a lot better. It can be a little confusing to understand the difference between all the advisories, watches and warnings that get issued during the winter time. But to break it down, make it a little bit simpler, let's look to making a pot of chili. Again, we all enjoy that warm, comforting dish during the winter months when we're assembling all the ingredients, whether it be the tomatoes, the beans, the meat, maybe even some peppers. We're collecting all the ingredients. The same thing happens several days in advance of a winter storm. We're eyeing if there's going to be enough moisture, what the temperature profile will be, where the storm is going to be moving the track. All those ingredients are coming together as we watch for the potential impacts for the winter storm. If it's going to be a mild chili that we make, not put a whole lot of spice or chili flavor into that, maybe then an advisory gets issued. It's a mild winter event, but if it's going to be a three alarm chili, high impact bowls there, comfort of comfort, uh, that's when we may see winter storm warnings get impact uh, issued for those high level impact winter systems. A watch usually issued anywhere from 24 to 60 hours in advance. Again, with a storm that we are watching for some impacts from snow and ice advisory, relatively minor events, lower snowfall totals, maybe a little bit of icing combination of both. Meanwhile, winter storm warnings are dangerous events that are imminent within the next 36 hours. We average anywhere from three to five winter storm warnings each season here in the capital region. A little bit higher for the lake effect zones off towards the west. This winter, though, the National Weather Service is testing some new guidelines to issue those warnings. In previous winters, the Weather Service had to consider different criteria for winter storm warnings. Parts of the area had a threshold of six inches, while others had a base of seven in a 12 hour period. This winter, most of the northeast region will be on the same playing field. The goal is to present a more consistent message across the region, especially for counties that may border another Weather Service warning area. Let's say Washington County, for example, in our forecast area in Rutland County and Burlington's area, there were different criteria for the two counties and they share a border. 
Did that make sense? Probably not. <laughs> An event total of seven inches will be tested as a universal benchmark for winter storm warnings in the Northeast this season. This won't be the only criteria that NWS meteorologists can take into consideration when issuing those warnings. There's also the timing of the event, the snowfall rate, the impact on everyday life. You know, if we get a lot of snow right at rush hour, it can have a much bigger impact than snow in the middle of the night. I mean, we've seen that, you know, you get a big snowstorm overnight. By the time you wake up in the morning, the roads are plowed and everybody's back at school the next day or back at work. A lot of terminology there, obviously, but they hope that with these new criteria, it's going to make it a little bit easier. I, the messaging is consistent. Yeah, you know, it can be confusing. Mm -hmm. It can be confusing to us. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. With the different offices around here. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I want some of that chili. Hey, I'll bring, bring you a batch. I'll you bring you a batch. Some <laughs> Three alarm or some mild. <laughs> I want the hot stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go all in. Now we do our best to give you lead time on some of these bigger storms. They can still come and they still bring serious threats to our health, even when the storms are over. That's true. If you're spending time outdoors, you probably see a lot of folks on the ice doing something, maybe fishing. You gotta be careful, it could be dangerous. Don't go away. You're watching the News 10 ABC Winter Weather Guide. Well, over the last five years, weather-related deaths are up 35%. Last year, winter weather was the leading weather-related cause of death in the United States and the second leading cause of injury behind tornadoes. And while we may be used to it here in the Northeast, this time of the year can take a toll on the body. Winter is a stressful time of the year. The holiday season can bring emotional stress. The cold and frequent doses of wintry weather can take a toll on the body physically. We're getting outdoors less, but there are still more risks of injury or even worse, death. According to data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, most winter weather related causes of death are not directly connected to a storm. People are involved in traffic accidents, suffer heart attacks or experience hypothermia. Wintertime accidents are avoidable by taking your time, slowing down, ensuring your vehicle is ready for the conditions being aware of your surroundings and driving carefully. You're not just driving in wintry conditions. A winter weather related injury may be waiting to happen as soon as you step out the door. Trips and falls are the number one cause of injury nationwide year after year. Uh, so we want to take extra time getting where we're going. And when it comes to walking safely, it turns out we can learn something from penguins. Penguins have figured it out. Penguins know to take short steps and they keep their, their weight centered over their feet. Uh, they keep their arms out to their side and they maintain good balance on slippery surfaces. We know the drill about dressing for the elements. Warm layers can help prevent cold weather injuries. It is important to know the warning signs of frostbite and hypothermia before the symptoms get worse. Hypothermia is a medical emergency that needs immediate attention. The combination of the cold air and physical activity like shoveling snow can put extra stress on the body and possibly lead to our third winter weather related cause of death. Heart attack. Uh, there's also more demand on what the heart's putting out to the body. The muscles need more and going outside to shovel heavy wet snow. Uh, the body is trying to do much more than it can. And it hasn't had to do that level of exertion in sometimes months and sometimes a whole year. And the heart's not ready for that. Cardiologists recommend not shoveling the walkway or driveway all at once. Stretch or walk a little before you start. Approach it in small bites, taking breaks in between and listening to your body. Uh, but really know your body. If you're feeling symptoms, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, sweats, stop, stop, sit, rest, get help. Uh, and if those symptoms persist, call for help, 911. Uh, don't delay. Every second that we wait, additional heart cells die in a heart attack. So time is muscle and time is critical. On this absolutely awesome November day, we're here at Thompson's Lake State Park. You know, it's, it's a gorgeous location. It's hard to believe that in six short weeks, there'll be ice here. People will be skiing and ice fishing. Remember, a good rule of thumb, shallower 
smaller ponds and lakes freeze fastest or earliest. The large bodies of water in deep bodies of water, such as Lake George, take a long time to freeze and be safe. You know, tragically, we hear about this every year, Ice is not safe, early ice, or people are rushing or don't know the body of water. They go out, uh, pets, people fall through ice, snowmobiles, four-wheelers, and where lakes allow it, even vehicles. So it's something that you have to be very, very careful with. Now, as many of you know, I'm big into ice fishing, especially in my younger days when I could take the, uh, the cold. Here's my basic setup. For those of you wondering, some safety devices in here as well. These are called tip-ups. You've seen them out on the lake. Pretty interesting, right? You take the flag, you run this into the hole, and when a fish pulls on it, watch what happens. The flag goes up and you know you have a fish. This is a basic tip up that most people use. Now of course we have what we call the ice auger. This is a hand ice auger to drill an 8 inch hole. Basically this is what you're doing and they work pretty good especially when the ice isn't real thick. So this is a gas-powered ice auger, drills a 10-inch hole, it makes life so much easier. It's heavy. Now, some of the safety devices that I use, one thing you got to be careful of is the ice can be slick. You don't want to fall. You don't want to hurt yourself. So I have these ice cleats that I can put on my boots. That's one style, and then there's another style that will slip over your boots like this. Now these are so important to have. They're ice spikes, basically homemade with wood, with a nail or screw, something that can dig into the ice. Basically you kind of wear them around your neck, and God forbid you fall through the ice, you can use these to literally drill and get a grip into the ice and pull yourself out. I love having these. I always have them with me just in case something like that happens. Again, very simple, but something that could save your life. And having a life jacket is not a bad idea as well. One last thing that I've done over the years, and I've actually used it once, I have a 50-foot piece of rope and I have a solid branch or a piece of wood attached to this. I carry that in my sled. Say somebody falls through the ice. You throw it to them, they can grab it, and you can help pull them out. I mean, this is something, literally, folks, that could save somebody's life. You've got to have something like this. Here are some other safety tips you need to know. Never go alone. Have a partner with you. Number two, if you're not familiar with a lake, talk to people. See where they're fishing. Ask questions. Go where people are. Number three, remember, first ice is the best ice. It's clear ice and is the strongest early in the season. Number four, be aware of moving water. Movement weakens the ice. Ice can be as much as 50% weaker. In number five, remember, when snow builds up on the ice, it acts as an insulator. The ice underneath, that snow does not get as thick as quickly as you would think. There are a few rules of ice thickness in the weight that that ice can support. Personally, and most people agree, at least four inches of solid ice is critical for safe conditions. Can less ice hold you? Yes, but you're taking big chances. For four-wheelers and snowmobiles, you need five to seven inches of ice. For cars and small trucks where they're allowed, eight to 12 inches. And for a medium-sized truck, you need as much as 12 to 15 inches of ice to be safe. 
can't mess around. Mm -mm. You know, uh, you hear these tragic stories every year. Um, ice thickness, again, early in the season is the best when it's clear ice. Um, give it time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's make ice before you take a chance and go out. You know, I know I, I, I'm a fisherman. I mm -hmm. say don't go fishing in the winter. It's just too cold out there. <laughs> but of course, give it time for the ice to grow. Mm -hmm. We may want to take our time on the ice, but one thing we hear oftentimes kind of it takes a little bit too long, you know, is getting the roads plowed after one of those really big snowfalls. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not easy as some may think. Coming up, we take a look at the strategy of clearing the roads here in the capital city. You're watching the News 10 ABC Winter Weather Guide. Welcome back. One of the major impacts of every storm comes after the snow yep. falls when it's time to clear the road so everyone can still get where they need to go. And you know, you need to be patient. You got to give these DPW crews uh, a little bit of time. Even in extreme situations, state of emergencies, emergency vehicles still need to travel the roads. And while it's our job to predict how much snow may accumulate, it's up to the state and local municipalities to clean it all up. And even after just like a moderate storm, yeah. that job is such a, a huge undertaking. I had the chance to speak with the folks at the Albany Department of General Services that tackle that challenge every year. It's that time of year. Snow is beginning to fall in Albany. Big storms have the potential to bring the city grinding to a halt. It's the Department of General Services job to keep that from happening. Frank Zioli is a deputy commissioner, and this has been on his mind for a long time. We're already a couple months in. We start having snow meetings sometime in August. As you get the heat of the summer, we're talking snow. Now, DGS needs to put those plans in action. During the snow-free months, their trucks are all over the place. We're used to, you know, haul blacktop, to, to, to haul thing, all kinds of things to do, all kinds of work uh, during, the, during the summer, spring and summer months. But in November, they all converge here at headquarters to get the plows put on and make sure they're in good working order. During a storm, over 40 of these trucks hit the road, keeping streets clear in the capital. But it's not just the plow drivers hard at work. We're cleaning sidewalks. We're cleaning crosswalks. We're doing ADA ramps. In total, over 200 employees in an all-hands-on-deck situation. The DGS also has a new tool in its arsenal these days. In addition to salting the roads before a storm, they're also putting down brine. Water and it's salt, okay? And we mix it to the salinity that it needs to be, and we have uh, several trucks that go out and they put it on prior to any storm. Brine can be applied up to two days before a storm. Unlike plain old dry salt, it doesn't get blown around or pushed off the roadway. And when done right, it gets roads back to bare pavement faster than the traditional method. But it's only a pre-treatment. Once the snow starts falling, plows and dry salt are still very much part of the game plan. Yes, it's a lot to manage, but Zioli says it pays dividends when the flakes fly in New York's capital city. We have a great group of people here. The men and women that work in this department uh, are dedicated and they're fearless and they go out. The task is a Herculean task, but they take it and they run with it. While we never anticipate getting stuck on the side of the road during winter weather, there are some essentials that you can have in your vehicle ready to go just in case. We're going to start in the glove box where we have some non-perishable snacks like granola bars, some trail mix, a bottle of water. That's good any time of the year. Some extra batteries. Now we want to talk about a vehicle emergency kit. It may start with your phone's charger. I keep the rest in the back seat in a special kit. So inside there, you may find some essentials like jumper cables, a small first aid kit with some bandages, some ointment, maybe some other small tools are in there as well. One tool that you may want to keep separate is a flashlight. I keep mine on the side of the door just in case. Uh, not only is this a flashlight, but it also has a strobe on here, which will be a way to alert other motorists and emergency services that you need help. You're stuck on the side of the road. A good way to, again, make sure people know where you are. This one also has a seatbelt cutter, a way that you can break the glass on the window if you are indeed stuck uh, and can't get out through the door. We're gonna move to the back of the truck now where we're gonna keep a shovel. Maybe it's not a full size one, but if you do have room in your trunk, more power to you. The sand may seem odd, but that and or kitty litter will actually give you more traction to get you going on those snowy and icy days. But of course, before you get going, you gotta clear all of the snow off of your car. That's where 
this essential for every person living in the Northeast in the winter time comes in. Snow brush, ice scraper, don't forget to get every single inch of snow off your car. That does include on the roof as well. When you're stuck, it's going to get cold outside as we know, so it's good to have some extra warm clothes ready to go. Maybe an extra pair of gloves, some extra socks, a sweatshirt, or an extra warm coat to keep you going. Also some hand body toe warmers that will help you out. One more essential you can keep in the back is a blanket because again, temperatures can be dropping quickly inside your vehicle if you are stuck. Speaking of getting stuck and conserving your vehicle as well, you don't wanna run out of fuel, you don't wanna run your car's battery down either. So what you're going to do is once an hour, you're gonna turn the car on for about 10 minutes. That allows you to get warm once again, but it also again doesn't drain the fuel or the battery good idea to always have at least half a tank of gas ready to go before you hit the road on those snowy days. One more important thing, tires. Making sure that they are properly inflated but also have good traction. So every car is different when it comes to what proper inflation is. Make sure you check the side of your uh, car door to find that out. Looks like the storm tracker is good to go. Not over, not under, just properly inflated. Also you want to keep your windshield free and clear. That's where some extra windshield wiper fluid will come in handy. With all those essentials, you should be good, safe, ready to hit the roads this winter across the capital region. Jill, great advice. Great tour of the mobile storm. Right, that has everything you need for mm -hmm. the winter weather when you guys are out there tracking the snow. I think I need a pickup truck for all that stuff, though, to get it all <laughs> Well, there. that was the other thing. Like, we were, like, hiding it underneath seats, putting it in the glove box, you know, obviously moving some stuff, equipment around. So, so long as it's there and accessible, right. you can use exactly. it. Exactly, because mm -hmm. when you need it, you want to have it. Absolutely. Have you don't want to have to go digging for it. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. All right, we've talked about people, places, and things, but we also have to remember our four-legged friends this coming winter. That we do. Coming up, some important notes for helping your furry friends stay safe in this winter season. You're watching the News 10 ABC Winter Weather Guide. As we all know, there are so many hazards in the winter, not only for us, but also our pets. Hypothermia and frostbite can affect them as well. The normal temperature for dogs and cats is about 100.5 to 102.5. When their body temperature starts to drop to 98, 99, somewhere in there is when we'll start to see problems. So initially what happens is the body's using this protective mechanism to shift all the blood from the extremities to the important organs like the heart and the brain. Now the areas to watch out for on a pet are very similar to those of a person. So their toes, ear tips is a very common area for us to see, the tails, um, any real extre extremity. Here are some basic tips for you. One, bathe your pets as little as possible in the winter. Number two, when they come in from outdoors, dry them off as quickly as possible. Three, feeding your pets a bit more in the winter will give them more calories and keep them hydrated so they don't develop dry skin. Now, number four, this is so important. Remember, antifreeze is a lethal poison for dogs and cats. Be vigilant to keep an eye on this. And number five, if there are cats living outdoors near you, always beep your horn before starting. Some cats will crawl up under the engine for warmth. Another thing to keep an eye on is salt in your pet's feet. If you take them for a walk, it can get painful. So we can see actually ulcerations and abrasions of the paw pads. A lot of the times because it is irritating, the pet will try to lick their paws as well. A good rule of thumb, if it's too cold for you, it's probably too cold for your pet. Always keep an eye out if you see pets out in extreme cold. Contact your police and animal control. And don't forget those booties and sweaters and jackets. They will make your pets so much more comfortable. Certainly very re important reminders for all of us dog owners. Oh yeah, now we've covered a ton so far. Uh, finally comes the big question. I'm sure you guys get this a lot. What do we think is going to happen this winter? Well, 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 well let's look hmm. into that crystal ball. Right, now we had one. Right, exactly. <laughs> now, if we believe one way of forecasting long-term winter forecast, we look at El Nino versus La Nina winters, mm -hmm. and this is going to be the third La Nina winter in a row. Uh, it comes down to some of the cooler temperatures off the coast of South America around the equator.
Yeah, I want to let's put up the uh, National Weather Service mm -hmm. outlook. This is kind of based on La mm -hmm. Nina. Now, one thing I want to point out: La Nina has very little impact on snow here. I've seen a lot of snow in La Nina winters and very little snow in La. So you can't look at this for snowfall. And there's the precip. A lot of lake effect, though, typically in a La Nina right, winter. Right, and hey, and we're already off to a fast start, oh, right? Oh, yes, we are, out mm -hmm. by Buffalo. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Yeah, exactly. We'll see how it all plays out. Of course, one thing you know, you can depend on us to lead the way through this winter. It certainly is a lot to keep track of, but we're up all night in some cases, mm -hmm. giving you that forecast. We thank you for watching it. And we also ask you to be a part of the process, too, from our weather watchers, everyone that takes time to report snow totals. They always send us pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah. We greatly appreciate that. And you got to remember, you know, it, it's a team effort. I mean, we've got a great weather team here. You guys are absolutely awesome. Mm -hmm. But you're part of that uh, weather team as well. Thank you for watching our show tonight. Be prepared and have a good night.